living things on this earth coexist. Sometimes as friends and sometimes as enemies. Whatever be the form of life, ultimately all living things decay and die. Unfortunately for us, this also happens to our food. Food, so vital for our sustenance, decays too. Look at the rich red tomato. What happens to it? Sad but true. Why does this happen? What causes it? How can we minimize and prevent spoilage? This program on food spoilage and its prevention will focus on these aspects. First, let us try to understand the concept of food spoilage. Food spoilage is a natural phenomenon involving loss in organoleptic desirability, nutritive value, safety and aesthetic appeal. Food decays in three ways, putrefaction, fermentation and rancidity. Biological decomposition of organic matter with the production of ill-smelling and tasting products is called putrefaction. Fermentation refers to chemical changes in organic substances produced by the action of enzymes. This is caused by the action of specific enzymes produced by organisms such as molds, bacteria and yeasts. For example, lactase, produced by bacteria usually found in milk, causes the milk to sour by changing lactose, that is milk sugar, into lactic acid. The third type of rancidity is associated with spoilage of fats. Like all food components, fats undergo deteriorative changes with time, which result in undesirable flavors and odors. These changes in fats are given the term rancidity. Having understood the concept of food spoilage, let us now look at the types of spoilage. What you see now is an example of physical spoilage. This means damage to the structure of the food. Now we all know that cut apple browns on exposure to air. Perhaps you would think this is because they are a rich source of iron. Certainly not. In fact, this is an example of chemical food spoilage. This is caused by the action of enzymes on the components in the food when exposed to air. So next time someone tells you that apples are a rich source of iron, you know the real story. Now this is not all. There is another type of spoilage that can be dangerous too. This is biological spoilage. Here the villains are the microbes. Yes, the bacteria, viruses, molds or fungi. They can be dangerous because some of them produce toxic substances which can kill us or make us ill. Some microbes present in the food at the time it is consumed enter the body and begin to grow and cause disease. So we have tried to understand the three types of spoilage. Let us go through them again. These are physical spoilage, chemical spoilage, biological spoilage. We also know that different foods have different rates of spoilage. Based on the ease with which food spoils, we can classify them into three categories. Perishable, semi-perishable and non-perishable. As is obvious, perishable food spoils fast and easily. Can you identify some perishable foods? That's right, milk and milk products, meat, fish. In fact, most of the flesh foods, fruits and vegetables. Non-perishable foods, on the other hand, are those which do not spoil easily. These would include food grains such as cereals 
and pulses which we can store for months under proper conditions. There are a few food items which may fall in between the two categories. These are semi-perishable foods such as eggs, potatoes and onions. The next question that may come to your mind is why do some foods spoil easily and others stay fresh for a longer time? Let us find out. We notice that meat and milk products spoil easily. On the other hand, food grains remain intact for a longer time. Why? This is because of the action of various factors which influence spoilage. What are these factors? These are moisture, oxygen concentration, temperature, pH and growth promoting and inhibiting factors. Now let us consider the effect of each of these factors. First moisture. Contrast the spoilage of liquid milk with milk powder. Liquid milk spoils in a day, whereas powdered milk lasts for several weeks. Why do you think this happens? Yes, you're right. It is because water is necessary for the survival and growth of microorganisms. In the absence of water, they just cannot grow. Just like water, oxygen is essential too. If the food is rich in oxygen or is exposed to the atmosphere with high oxygen tension, some types of microbes grow. These are called aerobic organisms. Interestingly, this does not mean we win the battle if we remove the oxygen. There are microbes that hate oxygen and survive best in its absence. These microbes are anaerobic organisms. The next factor is temperature. Now there is an optimum temperature for each microorganism's growth and development. If the food temperature does not suit the microbes, they cannot grow. Let's give you a simple example. You know how milk, fruits and vegetables last much longer in the fridge while they spoil so rapidly at room temperature. This is because temperatures in a fridge are much lower than the temperature which the microbes enjoy. Of course, we must tell you that microorganisms are of different types. Some love low temperature. These are psychrophiles. The room temperature favoring organisms are mesophilic. And the heat favoring organisms are called thermophiles. Psychrophiles can grow at about 0 degrees centigrade, but they grow best at moderate temperatures. We have talked about the bacteria so far, but molds also demonstrate similar patterns. You must have seen molds growing on foods that have been in the fridge for long. This means that microbes can grow at a range of temperatures from very low to very high. Let us come to another very crucial factor, that is pH. Have you noticed how vegetables pickled in vinegar last much longer than the raw or cooked vegetables? Why is this? Vinegar lowers the pH of the food or in other words makes it acidic. When we use the term pH, we refer to whether the food is acidic, neutral or alkaline. Here the point to remember is that foods with low pH values are not readily spoiled by bacteria. However, they are susceptible to spoilage by yeasts and molds. Two other very important factors for the growth of microbes is nutrient content and inhibitory substances. Nutrients in the food boost microbial growth. Inhibitory substances slow down or prevent their growth. Carbohydrates and proteins are nutrients which help the microbes. Hence, the food rich in these nutrients such as milk and meat are ideal for the growth of microbes. On the other hand, inhibitory substances such as lactinins and anticoliform factor in freshly drawn milk and lysosome in egg white inhibit growth of microbes. So we have just now studied the various types of factors influencing growth of microorganisms. Let us now try to understand how microbes grow. Under optimum conditions, microbes grow in a particular pattern. 
let us take a look at the typical growth pattern of microorganisms. This graph shows you the pattern. In the beginning, that is the left side of the graph, what you see is the lag phase. The lag phase is the adaptation phase before growth. In other words, this is the time when the microbes adjust and adapt to their environment and prepare for growth. As microorganisms grow, they form colonies made up of millions of individual cells. With this rapid growth, much of the nutrients in food gets exhausted and the growth slows down, becoming almost stationary. This shows up as a plateau on the graph. Once this phase is over, the microbes start dying off. Why? The millions of cells release excretory substances. As these accumulate, they become toxic for the microbes themselves and they die. So this is the final death phase. This growth curve gives us clues on how to prevent food spoilage. The basic principles that emerge are, firstly, prevent organisms from entering food and secondly, prevent growth of organisms already present in food. Now let us see how the organisms enter foods. Of course, one way is entry into food through cuts and bruises on the skin of the food, such as fruits and vegetables. Further, the microorganisms can gain entry by contamination with dirty water, utensils, handling and so on. Similarly, microorganisms already present in the food must be prevented from growing and multiplying. We do this by modifying conditions within the food or in the environment in which it is stored so that they do not find conditions suitable for growth. Let us now turn our attention to how we can prevent the growth of microorganisms already present in the food. Chill or freeze food to retard growth of microorganisms and inhibit enzyme activity. An example is frozen food. Heat food to destroy microorganisms and prevent enzyme activity. Pasteurized milk is an example. Place food in a salty solution to make water unavailable to microorganisms. Pickled vegetables are one example. Place food in a sugary solution to make water unavailable to microorganisms. We are all familiar with jam as an example. Treat foods to kill organisms and then keep food in airtight containers to deprive microorganisms of oxygen and prevent further contamination such as in the case of canned foods. Modifying the atmosphere in the packaging of a food product such as with meat product or potato chips. Reduce moisture content of food to make water essential for growth unavailable to microorganisms such as drying grapes to convert them into raisins. Use fermentation to produce food products with extended shelf life, for example milk to cheese. The various methods to control deterioration of food are canning that is destroying microorganisms and spores through application of heat and sealing food in cans. Pickling, that is placing food in low pH or acidic solution preventing microbial growth. Fermentation, which means lowering the pH of food by production of lactic acid. Addition of sugar or salt, thus making water unavailable to microorganisms. Dehydration, which is reducing moisture in food. Pasteurization, that is heating at high temperature for a short time to kill deadly pathogens. Sterilization, which means usually application of high heat and quick cooling to kill or prevent microbes from growing. Irradiation, exposure of food to carefully controlled amount of ionizing radiation. Freezing, use of very low temperature to inhibit growth 
and make water not available by formation of ice crystals. Modified atmosphere that is enclosure of food with a modified atmosphere adding suitable proportions of carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen and other gases. As we end this program, let us leave you with some handy tips for preventing food spoilage and keeping foods fresh. Package the freshest possible product. Use good sanitation and personal hygiene habits when processing and packaging food. Use the best possible packaging material for the length of time the food remains in the market channel. Cool processed or cooked foods as quickly as possible to below 3 degrees centigrade. Keep foods covered. Store foods and food products under the best conditions for preventing microbial growth. If you are involved with the running of a food service establishment, here are a few handy tips. Adjust inventory levels on perishables to reduce waste due to spoilage or dehydration. Use hourly or daily production charts to minimize unnecessary waste. Whenever possible, prepare foods to order. Adjust the size of meal portions if you find they are consistently being returned unfinished. Pre-cool hot foods, that is in an ice bath, before putting them in the fridge. Reuse leftover foods that have been stored at proper temperature within two days of preparation to prevent waste due to spoilage. Store leftover hot foods from different stations in separate containers to reduce the chance of spoilage. Wrap freezer products tightly, label and date them. Make sure they are used in a timely fashion to minimize waste due to freezer burn. Now, think of your own situation and context. We are sure you will be able to identify the specific measures you can take to prevent the entry and growth of microorganisms in your food. As consumers, managers of food service establishments or manufacturers of food products, we need to ensure that our food is not harvested, prepared or stored in conditions which favor spoilage. By preventing spoiling, we actually preserve food for consumption. Even more important, food spoilage is closely related to disease and even death. So, preventing food spoilage is of critical importance to us.